We must admit, however, that it is also a very difficult language to learn for most nationals with its complicated grammatical rules as well as many irregularities and exceptions in grammar and pronunciation. Especially for Asians, including Japanese and Koreans, whose mother tongues are very different from English in overall grammatical structures <coughs> and pronunciation, rhythms, intonation, whatever. So no matter how widely English is taught and spoken throughout the world, there is an unavoidable limitation to the role that English can play as an international language. So I suggest Esperanto. I've been, it's been on my mind for a number of years now as an international language for the whole world, and not only for Asians. As a common medium for international communication. Esperanto, which was devised by Dr. Zamenhof, a Polish oculist in 1887, is based on the common elements of European languages and is, and is characterized by very simple grammatical structure. There are only 16 bumpo no ruru garimasne, only 16 grammatical rules, that's all we have to learn to speak Esperanto. And words are pronounced, this pronunciation problem, words are pronounced as they are written. See, no exceptions in pronunciation. There's a very good match between sounds, pronunciation, and words. Because this is uh, inventive language. <coughs> Therefore, Esperanto is extremely easy to learn and pronounce for any nationals. I think it's especially easy for Japanese people. I mean, you have the syllables, <coughs> simple syllable structure, CV, consonant vowel, arigato, see, arigato, without any coda consonant, final consonant. And Esperanto is just like this. So in the period of over 100 years of existence, Esperanto has achieved a remarkable success. The language has proved itself to the full under all conditions. And there is no phase of human activity to which Esperanto cannot be applied with success. Teachers, doctors, journalists, scientists, Catholics, Protestants, police, railwaymen, scouts, socialists, spiritual, spiritualists, the blind and many other branches of thought and work are using Esperanto year in, year out for their work in the international field. The Esperanto literature consists of many thousands of books, including world classics. There are newspapers and broadcasting stations using Esperanto in many countries, let alone a larger number of magazines published in Esperanto. Since 1905, the Universal Congress of Esperantists has been held annually in a different country each year where the entire Congress program is in Esperanto only and no interpreters are ever used. Impartial observers attending the Congress have frequently expressed their amazement at this modern miracle where ordinary men and women from all the walks of life get together and exchange ideas and have fun using one common language. There was the international, the conference of Esper Esperantists in Seoul two years ago, in Seoul, and I attended that as guest of honor, and I was really surprised and really, you know, I had a very strange feeling that the only language, there were about 3,000 people gathered there in Seoul, in a big hotel, all Esperantists, men, women, young and old, from many walks of life, and they all spoke Esperanto, with one common language. No English, no Korean, nothing. And they are very happy. They enjoy themselves to the full. I'm not
not really here to advertise Esperanto, but uh, I think it's worth considering for the peace of the world and harmony among nations. I said, the next title, no other alternative but English for the time being. So no matter how, how much we would like to introduce Esperanto, we cannot do it right away. There are many objections to it from many different angles. It is something we cannot hope for in the near future, therefore. And there's nothing we can do to realize that this dream right away. So there's no choice but to go back to the discussion of the advantages of phonetics in teaching English pronunciation. Now, let me start by quoting a very interesting joke about Japanese. I call it phonetic joke about Japanese. I saw this story in a book titled Dirty Jokes. Dirty Jokes. It's, it's in series, you see. And as I travel uh, around the world, I bought a copy of this book in an airport, I forget where, and uh, there are many interesting items there, some uh, um, not very clean stories, but uh, this one was included there. It was a phonetic joke. It's about Japanese speakers' failure to distinguish two liquid consonants, R and L, and the story goes like this. A Japanese-American was a long-time customer at his Greek restaurant because he discovered that they, the Greek restaurant people, made especially tasty fried rice. Fried rice, you see? Each evening he did come in, he would order the Japanese-American, Ameri Japanese-American, he would order fried rice fried lice. This always caused the Greek restaurant owner to nearly roll on the floor with laughter. Sometimes he had two or three friends stand nearby just to hear the Japanese customer order his fried lice. Eventually, the customer decided to teach them a lesson. He took a special diction lesson. It's a kind of phonetic lesson, see? Um, to be able to say fried rice correctly instead of fried lice. Do you know what it means, fried lice? The next time he went to the restaurant, he said very plainly and correctly, of course, fried rice, please. He ordered fried rice correctly. Now, unable to believe his ears, the Greek restaurant owner said, he's very surprised, you see, Sir, would you repeat that? Whereupon, the Japanese-American replied, You heard what I said, you flucking gleek. Now, he returned to his original sort of habit, you see although he pronounced fried rice correctly. Putting an extra L in the word flucking. So I have no idea whether this is a true story or invented one by somebody. But it certainly is a highly plausible story, considering the usual Japanese practice, phonetic practice, with R and L. The story also tells us <coughs> the importance of phonetics in speech correction. That is, what it can do to improve our pronunciation. Now, let me move to the next item. Phonetics is essential in teaching pronunciation. There's no doubt about that. The science of phonetics can play an important role in linguistics, language teaching, speech pathology, music, stage arts, 
broadcast and criminal investigation, etc. Recently, the importance of phonetic science has been even more acutely felt in the fields of signal processing, speech synthesis, and recognition. And I'm happy to say that Japan is one of the leading countries in the world in speech science and technology. I know many professors and scientists, scholars in this field, because I'm also interested in that aspect of phonetics. Today, I would like to limit my talk, however, to the role of phonetics in teaching pronunciation, especially English. Let me um, quote uh, one or two the uh, well-known phoneticians in the past who expounded the essential nature, the importance of phonetics. Henry Sweet, I'm, I'm sure many of you know Henry Sweet, Englishman. In 1908, Henry Sweet, a great British phonetician and the undisputed father of modern phonetics in Europe, made a very impressive remark about the usefulness and advantages of phonetics in his book, The Sounds of English. And this is also included in English phonetic text edited by David Abercrombie of Edinburgh University under the title, Advantages of Phonetics. I have um, the printed, the, this book, published this book in Korea uh, in this format. And the story is in this book. Uh, no doubt slightly modified by David Abercrombie when he uh, published this book. I would like to quote some of the important points that Sweet made in his work. That is in the article, Advantages of Phonetics. It's, by, I, by the way, both in transcription, in transcribed uh, form, and as well as in uh, spelling. See, so I'm using this text in Seoul University for the graduate students as a drill, as a training in uh, pronunciation and also the uh, listening. Now first, the item he proposed was independence of residence abroad, meaning um, I'm not going to read all these passages there. It simply means that even if you, d you don't go to England or America to learn English correctly, to train phonetics, the pronunciation, you can do in your own country um, the, you can achieve everything you want in respect of pronunciation, see, if you know the phonetic knowledge, if you know real phonetics, so you don't have to go spending a lot of money abroad to the country whose language you want to pick up. So this is a very important point, I think. Two, independence of native teachers. In Korea and in Japan, I'm sure in many countries, they say to be able to speak good English or good Italian, good Japanese, you need some native teachers, see? Which has, which is, I mean, is truth in some way. But Henry Sweet said, we can dispense with native teachers. If you know the phonetic knowledge, real phonetic knowledge and training yourself. And I entirely agree with him. Now, there are point three, point four, and point five. Let's move to point five. Literary and aesthetic use. And this is the, the passage I like very much in my phonetics teaching and research. Number five, literary and aesthetic use. Phonetics alone can breed life 
into the dead mass of letters which constitute a written language. It's a question of written language and spoken language. A written language like that, the letters on the paper, there's no life there. It's a dead language. Phonetics alone, that is voice and its attributes, when you put them into this dead message, written language, you get the real living language. That's what he, what he means to say. It alone can bring the rustic dialogues of our novels for every intelligent reader as living realities and make us realize the living power and beauty of the ancient classical languages in prose and the verse. Yes. Number six, last point. The essential part of grammar, which what is? Phonetics is. Phonetics is not merely an indirect strengthener of grammatical association. It is an essential part of grammar itself, he said. Grammar nowadays is considered a separate sort of, you know, separate kakumo from phonetics. But Henry Sweet said in 1909 that it's closely interlinked element. Phonetics is part of grammar itself. Not only attribute or subsidiary to it, but it is a grammar. A knowledge of sentence stress and intonation is not only an essential part of elocution and correct pronunciation, but is also an integral part of the syntax of many languages. He concludes, in short, there is no branch of the study of language which can afford to dispense with phonetics. Without phonetics, you can't do anything about language study or teaching. That is what he tries to get across. Um, there are many other well-known scholars who advocated the importance of phonetics just to name a few, the Otto Jesperson, Jesperson, Jesperson of Denmark, the one of the founders of International Phonetic Association in, 19, uh, in 1880s. He also gave an impressive lecture at Columbia University in 1909 on the importance, the importance of phonetics. That's the title of his lecture there. Um, also, I can quote Eugène Ionesco, a well-known novelist, writer. He also touched on the difficulty of learning to pronounce. He said, pronunciation is a very difficult thing. It takes years and years, very long time to pick up good pronunciation, he confessed. But he went on and said, as follows. In French he said, pour apprendre à prononcer, il faut des années et des années. Mais grâce à la science, nous pouvons y parvenir en quelques minutes. Translated in English, it says, it takes years and years, as I said, to learn to pronounce rightly. But thanks to science, science of phonetics, however, we can do it only in a few minutes. Only in a few minutes we can do what would otherwise take us years and years. So much for the past scholars, the emphasis on the importance of phonetics. So we can conclude the theory of phonetics is essential. We should know something about the theory of phonetics before we can actually teach pronunciation to students or improve the pronunciation of ourselves. But to my mind, there's something else. 
So I said, there's no denying that the knowledge of phonetics will be an enormous asset for people learning and teaching pronunciation of foreign language. But here, one must bear in mind that we should be equipped with a real and authentic knowledge of phonetics, not a superficial one. Not a superficial one. I know there are many quasi phoneticians everywhere in the world, wherever we go, in many advanced countries too, there are many so-called phoneticians. But to my surprise, I found that they didn't really know about the world of sounds. They couldn't distinguish sounds themselves. And how can they teach students to pronounce rightly? See, it's a question of the qualification of these professors themselves. So that's what I mean. The real, authentic, solid background of phonetic knowledge, not superficial one. Those who talk about theories of phonetics but who cannot manage to pronounce the speech sounds of a foreign language correctly themselves. This is a great problem everywhere. If they teach wrongly, I mean, if they cannot really serve as a model for the students, you see, model for the sounds the students are going to pick up, and where, where would they have to depend, you see? They look to the professors only. So professors, and the phoneticians and English teachers in general should be prepared, should do something more about their phonetic knowledge, I think. Theory alone is not enough. That's my, that's my, you know, theories. Let me go on to Japanese mispronunciation in detail. For example, English vowels like a, as in cat, mad, and a schwa central vowel, uh, as in about, account, or uh, <coughs> as in earn, hurt, are especially difficult vowels for Japanese speakers to pronounce. Therefore, many Japanese fail to distinguish these vowels and tend to pronounce them as one and the same. They're the same vowel for many Japanese, except for those who have learned it correctly, see? The ordinary Japanese tend to mix them up. So all the words given above are usually pronounced as cut, mad, about, account, an, hard. All are vowel, the same vowel. Similarly, all vowels in the sentence, her mother was back, in the sentence her mother was back, would be pronounced by Japanese as what? Her mother was back. So again, the same vowel. Please consult the last page of your, of your, the sheets, handout. There you have vowel diagram English A is here, black vowel R here, and the British vowel cut love here, the vowel written like this, and there's a schwa and long bird, a third, a third in actual words. So one, two, three, four, and then in British English, the Oxford, the vowel O, oh, open O. Oh. All these vowels are recognized, perceived by Japanese, ordinary Japanese, that is, as <coughs> this wide territory, see? This wide territory of the vowel diagram as R sound, your R phony. 
And this poses a great problem in speaking English, naturally. You have five vowels only, i.e. uewo, Japanese five vowels. Koreans have nine vowels. English, just to talk about pure, simple vowels, 12, you see. And this is the root of the trouble. Mm -hmm. you are, it's quite sufficient for you to distinguish five vowels only in, in Japanese, in speaking Japanese. But you would need four more, four more in tackling Korean. And how many more? Seven more vowels. You have to distinguish in detail seven more vowels on this diagram to be able to speak English with clarity, with ease. So this air vowel, schwa, the er uh, and r, uh, or, uh, they should all be learned separately, independently of each other. So this is a problem, you see, when you have only five, it's very comfortable to distinguish them. You are quite used to five vowel system only on a phonological level. When you come to learn English, English pronunciation, you have to leave this phonological plane level and come down, further down, and enter the, the, the world of phonetics, world of allophonic world and be able to distinguish extra vowels. So, eh, uh, cat, cat. It sounds the same to you as ah. Uh, 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 the same to you. Ah, uh, also the same. Ah, uh, same. Ah, uh, the same. Well, some of you might have different opinion on this. I don't, I don't know. But this is my observation in the past 10, 15, 20 years. I've been uh, very close with many Japanese scholars. And the, the Onsei Gakkai no, uh, the scholars too. And I've always had many chances to observe their mispronunciations in dialogues, in, in Koen Dene. So, this is the duty of English teachers in Japan to distinguish, to help students distinguish these vowels cl clearly and distinctly. Shall I? And the important thing is two. There are two important things. First, as Daniel Jones pointed out, the first point is teacher should be able to uh, hear and distinguish two closely related vowels. He should be able to hear with his mimi uh, Now, and after that, he should tell the students what to do, how to approach that. He should check by dictating the sounds to the students if they can discriminate, they write down using phonetic symbols, and they check with this teacher's model later on. If there's a discrepancy, if there's a difference, if they made a mistake, then it means students fail to distinguish the sounds pronounced by the professor. So the ear training exercise is very essential. And after that, when the teacher is fairly satisfied, happy with the performance of the students, students perception, that is listening, then he can go on to teach, to, to help the students to utter, to pronounce the sounds correctly, using his own tongue, lips, vocal organs, you see. This is an individual problem. And the it's no use just to simply repeat the theory. For instance, let me just talk about the central vowel. It's no good just to say that 
In phonetic theory, this is central vowel. See? Det center. Oh, that's that. And students all understand. Oh, yes, they can write down at the exam. What's this? Central vowel. Correct answer. And if you finish the course there, nothing happens, you see. The student's pronunciation will never improve. What comes next is more important. You should have a concrete, kudaitekina, hoho ga naruto dame desu ne. Kudaitekina hoho wa, I'll, shall I try and teach you just one thing here? The schwa, er, and er. Bird, heard. Now, as I said, Japanese tend to pronounce it hard, cut. Without, not instead of heard, cut, they say hard, cut. What's the difference? Mouth is opener, more open, you see. So try, teachers try, should try to help the students close their mouth. That's a good idea, you know, instruction. How? Using either ballpoint pen or yoji, even. Yoji is better. Or even your finger. I'll teach my students, I have been teaching my students like this. Koreans also have a difficulty with this vowel. You see? Koreans say instead of heard, they say hard. A back vowel, opener, here. Yeah. Secondary cardinal six, R. The method I'm using is this. Close your mouth, see? And then uh, put your, try to put your finger, this finger, between the teeth, upper and lower teeth. There's a very narrow gap made there. And say, and also put the tip of your tongue Put the tip of your tongue the under, under, behind the lower teeth. Like that. Lower teeth. So this is the, the scheme. And then try to say ah, Japanese ah, or Korean ah. Without the tongue tip leaving the teeth, you see. And uh, without opening your mouth. So in this position, students try to follow me. Uh, 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 uh. You can never go to R. Because when you open your, when you, go, when you pronounce R, your mouth is automatically open. So, uh, 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 uh. Now stop there. And take out your finger, gently, without moving, without changing the tongue position. So students do as follows. Uh, right, that's, that's, that's a schwa though. See? That's a schwa, nothing else. Now once you've succeeded in doing that, you should try and memorize and keep the acoustic image in your head, in your mind. Uh, so whenever you want to say uh, in English, you can have it out immediately. Uh, uh, heard, bird. When you fail again later tomorrow, say, then repeat this again. Close your mouth, put your finger, and try to say ah, ah. Ah, 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 which is correct, uh, see? So this kind of uh, practical, practical instruction is essential at the beginning stage. Yeah, I came, I flew to Nagoya yesterday. Something happened at the Nagoya customs office, see? I brought only one small bag, nothing in there. No tobaccos, no liquors, no whiskeys. Just a small bag. <laughs> and the, the customs lady, this young lady about 30 or 31, stopped me and asked, looking at my passport, 
she knows I'm from Korea, she said, she's asked me some questions which I couldn't understand. You see, there was some I mean, noisy surrounding, of course, but she said something like, very good looking, nice, beautiful lady, said, Papas, Papas. And I couldn't really understand, you know, what she said, Papas. So I said, what? I'm sorry, I, I don't, I'm not with you. Could you repeat that? And she said again, Papas. <laughs> I've searched my <laughs> head and tried to think of all the English words, because I know she was speaking English. And then suddenly it occurred to me, yes, she was talking about purpose. This is about purpose. Purpose, see? Now she didn't observe my instruction. Well, I didn't teach her <laughs> after all. But if I taught her before like this, she wouldn't, she wouldn't make such mistakes, you see? Her mouth was pa pas, whereas the right person would be per pas, pa pas. So much opener. That's the difference, you see. Oh, it was a great trouble for me. <laughs> and I said, is it my fault or her fault? Her English teacher's fault or my fault? Even if her teacher's education was not good, then me, as a professor of phonetics and linguistics, should, you know, have some idea, you see, very soon. But it took me many, I mean, much long. The silos are very, very long, you see. So it's a very disappointing experience. So I decided to tell you this story in detail today. So one last point. Just one last point, because time is um, running. I'll move to uh, this prosodic thing, you know, the rhythm and intonation problem, especially to intonation. Um, yes, seven, page eight. The English speech rhythm is another important element the Japanese students seem to find extremely difficult to tackle. I should think that the rhythm problem is much more serious for Japanese learners of English than any other single factor, because it makes the English not only un-English, not like English, but also on many occasions sometimes totally unintelligible misleading. Professor Suzuki here, the president of EPSJ, pointed out difficulties of learning the English rhythm for Japanese students when he said, Japanese language has a syllable timed rhythm which, which consists of mora, mori. Fair enough. He continues, he Jap in Japanese, each mora which occurs regularly, has equal duration in length. Same length repeated endlessly, like da, 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 da. He talked about this in his article, How to Teach English Intonation to Japanese Students. It's a paper presented to a 1996 seminar on phonetics, organized by the Phonetic Society of Korea. Suzuki-san demonstrated how the English one-syllable word strike and two-syllable word, two-syllable word ice cream are uh, resyllabified in the Japanese mouth as a six and seven mora words respectively. You see, Japanese are very good at making syllables. From one syllable, they produce two, three, four, five syllables. Like film, that's one English syllable, film. You make how many? Fuirumu, five syllables, you see? 
ice cream, two syllable word, ice cream, six syllables. See? So uh, six, seven, I mean, two syllables becoming six, seven. It's an enormous expansion, I must say. And it says, the strike, the word strike and ice, ice cream are pronounced by Japanese as six and seven equal beats, like the rhythm of a quick march. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Aisu kurimo. Aisu kurimo. Straiko. Straiko. On the other hand, native English speakers utter them automatically with a strong single beat in the case of the what? Strike. Strike. And with a medium beat, followed by a strong beat for the word ice cream, see, ice cream. Because they are simply used to the so-called stress time, the rhythm of English. They learned it from their childhood, you see. I would like to symbolize the syllable time the rhythm for convenience as da 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 Japanese rhythm, da 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 Spanish da 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 Greek da 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 That is medium or weak syllables coming in sequence regularly. And stress time rhythm, that is English type rhythm as the tongue. This is a sort of a mnemonic uh, word I devised. The tongue. The D is weak syllable. Tang, very strong beat, very strong syllable. So the tang is rounded, the composed of, consists of strong, weak, uh, weak strong, weak. The tang, the, see? Now, if you um, try and read this word in ordinary way, you can automatically, you will find yourself giving more stress to tang. The syllable structure is full, C, B, C, and also hard sound, ta, and um, final sound, whereas D is weak, and the vowel E is weaker than R, ah, see? So it's so constructed that you can automatically produce the tang D. Weak, strong, weak rhythm. Now this is typical of English, or tang D, D, the tang D. Here again, the teacher should be able to demonstrate the right rhythmic pattern of words like, you know, your country name, your name of your country, Japan, is usually pronounced by Japanese how? Japan. Or Japanese. Japanese. Da 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 da. Japanese. Four syllables, see? Whereas English, Japanese. Japanese. Two beats there. So, tang di tang di. Rhythm should be employed to produce the sound rightly in English. Tang di tang di. But you said Jap Japanese. Same duration, same force in sequence. That's the basic problem of your basic rhythmic problem. Um, It is interesting to know the Japanese national anthem, your Kimigayo, has this very uh, rhythmic pattern, you know, typical of Japanese speech rhythm. Da 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 da. Kimigayo wa dang 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 dang. Equal length. You see, there is equal length. I'm not sure whether this has something to do with your actual speech rhythm. I don't know. More research is needed to find out. But English people, for instance, would pronounce this word, Kimigayo. You see? Kimigayo. Democratic. He patterned it like word, democratic English. Democratic. Kimigayo. Ki and ga are stressed. Well, this is their own habit, English, British, American, that's that. But 
unless you adopt Esperanto as a world language, a second language, you should try and learn it, you see? Otherwise your English will be very un-English and unintelligible. Well, I, should, I shouldn't emphasize the importance of Esperanto too much. Otherwise I'll get terrible, um, what? No, there's, um, I mean, Esperanto is adopted worldwide. English professors, phoneticians will lose their jobs. Only Esperantists, you see, getting more job opportunities. So, so this is, I mean, the core of the matter. Um, so once students hear the difference of this rhythmic pattern, English and Japanese, they should be, uh, try and follow the instruction given by the professor, how to produce the right the rhythm, you see. And here, uh, I think the the Juventus and AC Milan and the, the national anthem of Italian national anthem was played very lively. It goes like this. Dun dun ta dun 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 ta dun 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 ta dun 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 ta dun not nothing like da 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 syllable timed. The Italian anthem, national anthem, is also stress timed like English. Dun dun ta dun 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 ta dun 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 ta dun 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 dun. Very lively and very the you know complicated rhythmic structure. Now, if I uh, write down the Italian national anthem, the, uh, the rhythmic pattern of the national anthem. Dun, dun, da, dun. Two bits there. This is the Italian. Dun, dun, da, dun. Now, if you turn it into syllable timed. Dun, 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 dun. Like marching, like a marching song. If you, you know, if you superimpose English words like, why don't you know? Why don't you know? It corresponds exactly. Why don't you know? Instead of, why don't you know? See? Typical Japanese rhythm. So please, please come to see me. Please come to me. Why don't you know? Please love me too. They're all the same rhythmic pattern, you see, pronounced with the same pattern. So I think this kind of music technique, musical rhythm technique is very useful. You have to change your habit, rhythmic habit completely. When you learn a new song, a new melody, I mean, how often, how many times do you have to practice it, you see? Sometimes, a hundred times, still you forget some melody, rhythm, rhythmic pattern. So, you also should be prepared to put enormous amount of time into practicing this foreign rhythm. The foreign rhythm, English rhythm. So that you can get used to it, and when you want to pronounce it next time, it can automatically come out of your mouth with correct pattern. So there's a lot to be done in this field. Training of professors, devising the new techniques for teaching, and also tremendous burden on students themselves. But we have to do it. There's no other alternative. No machines can replace human beings, you see. There's a talking machine developed nowadays. But as long as we have our vocal organs, as long as we live and communicate with other people, 
you should try and use your vocal apparatus, articulatory organs, yourself. You can only depend partially on other things, the advanced machines of today, such as talking machine. Well, because of time a little bit, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks.